So Intel's new Alder Lake CPUs are just around the corner, and today we can finally start looking at some of the motherboards that will come with these processors, because yes, you will need a new motherboard for these new chips. Now, unfortunately, I'm not really allowed to talk about anything that is performance related in any way. So today I wanted to focus more on the overall feature sets that these ASUS motherboards have to offer, uh, talk about what's new in this generation, uh, what sets them apart from each other, and just basically figure out which motherboard will make the most sense for you. But first, this video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime Series power supplies. These top quality power supplies are very efficient, they're whisper quiet, extremely reliable and my go-to choice for most of my test rigs and builds around here. And to make the deal even sweeter, Seasonic wraps it all up in a cozy 12-year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. The two big feature upgrades that Alder Lake CPUs will bring to this new generation of motherboards are the support for DDR5 memory and the PCIe Gen 5 support. Now the DDR5 RAM should grant some performance improvements over the DDR4 and even though most boards will focus on this DDR5, there will be some DDR4 boards available as well for those of you that don't want to upgrade your memory kits just yet. And while the PCIe Gen 5 support isn't something that you need to worry about right now because well, all current GPUs don't really make use of it and the first PCIe Gen 5 SSDs will not be launched till next year. It is nice to know that your PC will be ready for that when that happens. I have seven different models right here and I'm gonna start with the most basic one, the Tough Gaming Z690 Plus D4 board. And the D4 at the end of the name indicates that this motherboard supports DDR4 memory, unlike the other six that will only support DDR5, although I do expect there will be a DDR5 version of this as well. And it will also offer no Gen 5 SSD support, which is technically not a big deal just yet, but the first PCIe slot is Gen 5 ready. Now, even though this is the most entry-level model, I have to admit that with each generation, the visuals have improved a lot. Now, they dropped most of those old bright yellow accents for something that is more neutral and that would fit most systems out there. I actually quite like this simple design. It is not over the top. It looks like a solid board and it definitely doesn't look like a cheap one. If you want a lot of RGB, this is not a motherboard for you. I also think calling this an entry-level board isn't completely accurate, considering all the features you do get. Usually, entry-level boards have limited M2 slots, while this one right here offers a total of four PCIe Gen 4 SSD slots, with three of them having a proper heatsink. Also, all of the SSD slots do come with one of the best and biggest quality of life improvements that ASUS is bringing to this whole generation, and that is the Q latch. It just makes SSD installation so much easier, and you don't have to mess with those tiny little screws anymore or just worry about losing them. It is one of those tiny changes that just makes a huge difference to the overall user experience. Lower end boards usually cheap out on the audio chip as well, but the ALC S1200A chip is what you would find on previous generation high end boards, as well as a 10 gigabit type C front panel header, which was not the standard before. Now, the back panel has a built in IO shield uh, with a total of eight USB ports, including a 20 gigabit one. There is a 2.5 gigabit LAN, Wi Fi 6, and an optical out. Now, it does look like a CPU-less BIOS update is impossible here, which is a bit disappointing, even though uh, that won't be an issue until the next generation of CPUs actually comes out. Now, this board is missing some of the enthusiast features like the postcode or some physical buttons, but overall, I think it is actually very well rounded. I mean, for anyone that is just building a nice gaming PC, this motherboard will be just enough. I would still wait for a proper review of the VRM performance, but considering it actually uses 1480 amp power stages for the CPU and a decent heatsink, I really don't expect to see any issues there. The next step up in this lineup would be the Asus ROG Strix Z690E motherboard. It has more RGB, it is bulkier, and it has more of a in-your-face design in general with 
little tiny details like this M2 heatsink sticking out, for example. It is just overall a great looking board, uh, much better than many of the hero boards from previous generations, except for the dark hero, which is still, in my opinion, the prettiest princess of them all. Now, the biggest upgrade that this hero motherboard does include is the support for PCIe Gen 5 SSDs, which is one of the key upgrades of older Lake CPUs that will benefit you in the future. Now, the first M2 slot supports Gen 5, with the other two slots on the board supporting Gen 4 SSDs. And the Strix also comes with an expansion card for two more SSDs. Now, the one I got says it's Gen 5, but the slot that it is supposed to go into says it's Gen 4. So I just assume uh, they included the wrong accessory on my sample and it should be a Gen 4 expansion card. Now, that doesn't really matter that much because PCIe is backwards compatible. So that means that uh, it should work well with both Gen 4 and Gen 3 drives anyway. Uh, either way, expect to use a maximum of one Gen 5 SSD and four Gen 4 ones. Other upgrades are smaller, but they do add up, uh, like the inclusion of the postcode, eight fan headers, the upgraded audio chip, and the Type-C front panel connector that is now a 20 gigabit port. Uh, you get a couple of extra USB ports, which is nice, and Wi-Fi goes from 6 to 6E. Overclocking on this board should also be better, as it features 18 plus one 90 amp power stages, which puts it well above the hero boards from last year. So I do expect this board to be popular with anyone that is looking for a bit more of a premium but complete feature set. Now moving on to the Asus ROG Maximus Z690 Hero. Now, first of all, I was so happy to see that they removed those Roman numerals from the name and just simply included the chipset number instead. It is just so much easier to keep track of it that way, especially when you already have a couple of generations laying around. Now, considering how good and how well-rounded the Strix has become, and assuming that this Hero motherboard will be even more expensive, puts a lot of pressure on this model, especially since most core features like the fan headers, uh, like the RGB headers are the same, or they're at least very similar. Also, the upgrade to 20 plus one and 90 amp power stages probably doesn't make a big difference either, with both of these motherboards being an overkill anyway. Now, the Hero doesn't support Gen 5 on the actual board, uh, which feels like a downgrade, but you do get a proper Gen 5 expansion slot on the bottom of the board, which allows you to add two Gen 5 SSDs using the included expansion card. For testers and reviewers that very often use their motherboards outside of cases, having those physical buttons on the board is a must and also a good reason to upgrade. They will also really appreciate the Q-release button that will make swapping GPUs so much easier. Actually, the Strix has that too, but without those physical buttons, I wouldn't really call it a nice hobby board. Now, compared to the Strix, here it does come with some extra headers for custom water cooling as well, and it brings two Thunderbolt 4 ports to this segment, which was pretty rare to see before. After the Hero, the ROG lineup basically splits up into products that are more specialized for a particular group, but it also brings up some of the best looking motherboards I have ever seen. Now, the new ROG Maxima Z690 formula is just purely gorgeous uh, with its white and silver theme covering most of the board. And of course, the inclusion of the EK water block on the VRMs to keep them nice and cool. You get 20 plus one 105 amp power stages. So it is a slight improvement over the hero. But just like it, formula is being pushed into a corner by the board before it, especially now that the Hero features those extra water cooling headers that were previously only offered by Formula boards. Now, the main difference is the addition of the 10 gigabit LAN, while the Hero is still stuck on 2.5. Um, other than that, it is pretty much the same motherboard. But I do think that at the end of the day, the design of this motherboard is what makes it stand out, especially with its OLED display and the silver expansion card for Gen 5 SSDs that just make the whole package look so much more elegant than the rest. Now, then we have the ROG Maxima Z690 Apex, uh, which is the famous overclocking motherboard. 
This runs a two-slot DDR5 memory layout, which should increase memory performance and overclocking, and it comes with all kinds of overclock-specific buttons and little tiny switches. Now, you have to appreciate the absolutely massive postcode they added, so even the liquid cooling enthusiast can just read it through the thick nitrogen mist. And let's all take a moment to look at that ridiculous 24-stage power delivery for Honestly, I don't even know what for anymore. I mostly expect to see this board in the hands of those hardcore overclockers that are trying to break each other's records or something in those lines. I mean, you can use this as a daily driver as well. Um, it offers most of the mainstream features like support for a total of five SSDs, including one Gen 5 SSD using the expansion card. And I do imagine some people will want it just for the looks alone. But keep in mind, you will have to pay a hefty price premium for that privilege. Now the ASUS ProArt Z690 Creator Wi-Fi motherboard is another model with a very specific audience in mind. The ProArt features Thunderbolt 4 as well, but adds DisplayPort in connection so you can directly connect your GPU to Thunderbolt displays if you own any of those. It also features a 10 gigabit LAN, so it is clearly targeted at a more professional audience as the name implies. Still, there are 17 power stages under the pretty sizable heatsink, so it is likely that performance should not be an issue here either. But there are some things that I am personally missing on this motherboard. Uh, first, it doesn't have an optical out, for example, but more importantly, there is no support for Gen 5 SSDs, either on the board or via the expansion card, while the creators are the main group that will actually highly benefit from faster SSDs, even more so than gamers, so I truly see this as a downside. I guess the main thing that will drive people to buy this board is that Thunderbolt display support. And the last, but not the least, and by far my personal favorite, is the ASUS ROG Strix Z690i Gaming. I mean, look at it. It is just absolutely adorable and kick-ass at the same time. Now, ATX motherboards often have their features balanced in such a way that every step up in price makes some sense, but it takes some pretty clever engineering to get a ton of features on a tiny ITX board like this one. Now, ASUS is actively using the power of height yet again to offer as many features as possible, considering the lack of space. For example, you get two Gen 4 SSDs, which are cooled on both sides of the drive, while other ITX boards often just put the second SSD on the back, and potentially that can cause some cooling issues, especially if you use a high-performance SSD. You also get a USB 2.0 splitter, so you can connect both USB ports as well as any software-driven RGB products, like from Corsair, NZXT, or even ASUS themselves. And since they ran out of space around the memory, they added a cute little vertical board uh, that adds four SATA ports and a second addressable RGB header. It also brings the front panel connectors a bit more up, which makes it much easier to install in a teeny tiny case. Now the back panel is pretty cool too, with seven USB ports, two Thunderbolt ports, 2.5 gigabit LAN and an optical out, so it is definitely an improvement over the other ITX boards from the past. Now the main real limitation I see is that with a single PCIe expansion slot you're again missing out on Gen 5 SSD support. Overclocking room is also likely to be a bit more limited compared to some larger boards, but it still offers a 10 layer PCB and a 10 plus 105 amp power stage design, so I really doubt it'll be an issue for most users. Another concern is that some air coolers might run into problems with the height of the SSD stack as well as the pretty tall heatsink, so make sure it will fit before you get one of these. But let's get back to these motherboards right here and summarize it all real quick. Now I think that considering how good the new Tough Gaming has become, it should be one of the first options most people should look at, um, especially if you don't really plan on upgrading your whole system right away. Now the Strix motherboard will be a nice upgrade for anyone that is looking for a bit more mature features and somebody who wants to prepare for the future with a DDR5 memory and the new Gen 5 SSD support, while the Hero will probably be for the 
um, PC enthusiasts that actively play around with their systems and that are trying to get a bit more out of their motherboard. And as I've said, from there on, it really just depends on what specific feature or design you're looking for. And even though I don't know any prices just yet, make sure you're prepared to pay a hefty premium for pretty much all of them. Now, there are a couple of things that are specific to ASUS motherboards, but I cannot really go into some of them right now. Now, the first one is that all of these motherboards have double mounting holes. Socket LGA 1700 comes with a new mounting standard, which means that your cooler will have to be compatible to your new motherboard. And that happens either through product updates or through extra mounting kits, which actually are available from many manufacturers today. But ASUS has added support for previous generation coolers with little extra mounting holes on these motherboards. Now, even though it all looks pretty simple, there is actually a catch here. It is possible that due to high differences, some coolers might not put enough pressure on the processor, which will hurt the performance. So definitely keep an eye on that if you plan on using older coolers. ASUS is also pushing their BIOS as one of the main features that will set them apart from the competition. Uh, now, AI overclocking is being updated to support Intel's new P and E cores, and that can be a really handy tool to help you find a good overclock to start with. But the new AEMP feature might actually make the ASUS BIOS stand out even more. So the DDR5 now includes its own power management, which means that some DDR5 kits might have their voltage locked and might be limited in terms of overclocking. Now, ASUS claims that this AEMP feature can actually go around this limitation, basically just unlocking these kits and making overclocking possible, which does sound very interesting. That being said, I don't really have such a memory kit just yet, and I don't know if that will work or not, but it's definitely something to keep your eye on. Anyway, that is actually all I had for today. Please do let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions about these ASUS motherboards right here and if you are interested in other brands, for example, because I will be going over some of the competition in the next few days. So make sure you click that subscribe button to never miss an upload. Bye guys and see you in the next one.